Hello everyone, my name is Yuri Krikun, I'm a FIDE master from Ukraine with an international master norm and a chess coach. Recently I have produced my first video course for thechessworld.com and today I finally decided to uh, commence my own YouTube channel where I would try to produce some entertaining content as well as instructive content for those who want to uh, learn how to play chess better. So today I'd like to offer you my very first video when I would like to talk a bit about the positions with the isolated pawn, pawns, how to handle them and what are the typical plans of both sides. So let's get started. To begin with I'd like to demonstrate you a rather old game which however is one of my favorite ones since it illustrated the dangers of um, lacking in development and underestimating opponent's attack quite distinctly. I will tell you later who, who were the players. And now let's arrive at one of the critical positions in order to discuss it later on. So it was a normal Queen's Gambit accepted. Black went e6, Bishop takes c4, c5. All the theoretical moves so far, castles, a6, Queen to e2, b5, Bishop to b3, uh, Knight to c6. And that's already one of the first inaccuracies. People mostly start with Bishop to b7 since it's important to be able to put the knight on d7 later on. <coughs> However, black went knight to c6 in this game, obviously, e even though it's not very accurate, it's not a losing move, so let's not stop on, on this one, uh, since I think the primary goal for us today would be to discuss the uh, isolated bone position. Bishop to b7, e takes d4. And Finally, we arrive at a pretty standard structure when white has an isolated pawn. What are the ideas for both sides? Based on my vast uh, coaching practice, I know that uh, quite a lot of club players and amateurs actually don't know about that much about this position. However, many of them, for some reason, are inclined to think that an isolated pawn is always something bad and is always something to be afraid of getting because they know that it is weak, it cannot be protected by pieces, so you should, you should be trying to avoid it. However, White also has quite a lot of advantages in return. For instance, well, right here he has a big, a large lead in development, but overall he also has the two open files for his pieces. The rook uh, can operate on the e file as well, as well as on the c file. The white knight can go to e5 on many occasions, and also the pawn on d4, secures quite a significant space advantage for white, especially if the knight is, uh, for instance, on d7, since the white knight is able to uh, come to e5. Also, very often, let's return for a second in order to discuss a slightly different position, for example, c5, castles, takes, takes, oops, e takes d4, should rather be played, bishop e7, knight, knight c3, say castles, and for example, something like a3. So one of the plans for white is to develop his bishop, then play queen to d3, develop the rook, and then try to build up a batter against the black king with bishop to a2 and then bishop to b1. Together with the queen on d3, of course, it creates rather unpleasant threats over the uh, b1 h7 diagonal, which would finally force black to make some concessions, and of course, it's rather clear what white should be doing. So, in my opinion, such positions very often provide white with very obvious for play, and uh, in my opinion, to attack is much easier rather than defend, so to get an isolated pawn in order to achieve such, an, such a position might be a very good idea. However, of course, again, let's just go to such a position, since I feel it's way more typical rather than what we're going to look at. Uh, Black also has his own uh, share of chances, his main idea would be to trade a lot of pieces, since at the moment, as we know, white has space advantage as well as some initiative. So basically just uh, getting all the minor pieces off the board would make sure to, uh, to extinguish white's initiative. And later on, black would be able to attack this pawn and four in the endgame, since, since it cannot be protected by uh, white's other pawns. For example, let's just help ourselves by trading all the pieces. Of course, the sequence wouldn't make any theoretical sense. I just want to demonstrate what is the uh, well, oops, what what is the uh, 
position you should definitely be afraid of getting it white. For example, say rook d1 takes, takes, let's just make some moves, some, I don't know, whatever, takes, takes, it doesn't make any sense, but please don't judge me. For example, queen takes d5, say queen g3, takes, takes, okay, let's, <laughs> it, it didn't make any sense whatsoever, but finally we can just uh, look at the positions that we should definitely uh, avoid by all means as white or as a side that has an isolated pawn, because something that uh, black would be doing as well as white. So both sides would probably double up here. Black would just play rook to d7 and rook to d8. It would be even better to have the queen at the end of this column on the d-file rather than in the beginning. But what's very likely to happen is that black will just be able to go e5 at some point when all the pieces are tripled up over the d-file. And the pawn on d4 would just be lost, which would mean white would face an extremely unpleasant endgame, maybe a lost one. But let's return to the game. Since here Black never managed to consolidate his position and finish the development, Black and Bishop to b7, e takes d4. And here I would like to ask you a rather interesting question. I would encourage you to stop the video since Black went knight to b4. And here we need to think as white what to do. Since, uh, as we know now, Black would like to block the pawn with knight to d5. That's a weak square, so White would never be able to, to challenge with his pawns and then just finish the development in order to start swapping pieces later on. So what should White do, since he is better developed and uh, he needs to benefit from that somehow? Please think. Yeah, as I said, if Black manages to go knight to d5, followed by bishop to e7 and castles, Black would get an excellent position. Which is why White, cannot, White doesn't have any time to lose. So he continued, d5, a very powerful continuation. The uh, point is revealed uh, in a few short variations. Black took with that knight in the game. If he took with the other knight, what would happen? How can white win here? The thing is, uh, there is quite a lot of pins. There is a pin down the e file as well as over the d file. So. We just need to calculate knight takes d5. Unfortunately, we don't have enough pieces at the moment that attack the square on d5. For example, knight takes, bishop takes. Oops, the wrong piece. And the black bishop is just able to recapture. However, uh, if we manage to distract one or more defenders, we would simply win. Which is why here, a rather unexpected little move a3 just wins us a piece, since if the black knight goes back, we will just simply capture and win the game. So, yeah, and if black uh, takes here, then white can capture on d8 with a check, which is rather crucial. And, of course, it wins as well. So black took with the knight. Now the idea is to go bishop e7 and castle. White continued bishop to g5, bishop to e7. How to play here as white, since black seems to be ready to just castle? White continued his extremely energetic play with a very precise move, bishop takes f6. The point being that, of course, the knight is not able to recapture. As we know, because of numerous pins, the black bishop isn't able to take either, since white just takes on d5 and wins a piece. Bishop takes, bishop takes. I'd even say more than a piece, because not only the rook is hanging, but also a check uh, with the discovery on the black queen, so at least a rook, probably. Which is why black had to attack with a pawn. White took on t5, bishop takes, bishop takes, pawn takes. And as a result, it uh, might not seem very obvious why did we do that, because we are a pawn down at the moment, so some rather inexperienced players uh, may think that it wasn't a very good sequence by white. However, in fact, white's position is absolutely overwhelming, since, uh, first of all, uh, black structure is absolutely horrible, uh, these pawns are doubled, which means that the king would never be in safety in, on the king's side. The pawn on d5 doesn't matter at all. Black's bishop is horrible. And very importantly, it's not about pawns. I was just trying to uh, reassure and calm down people who are too worried about the pawns. Most importantly, it's about the development. Black is not developed at all. And white is just ready to go knight d4, knight f5, and wins the game by creating uh, two strong threats. White just went knight to d4. And if castles, then after knight to f5, it's high time black resigned, since 
both queen to g4 with a mate on g7 and uh, the bishop are hanging. Black decided to try to resist with king to f8. Knight to f5, h5. And here, if you want to win this game, you just need to find one more decisive continuation. How to follow up as white. When you feel that the position is already ripened and ready for the decisive actions, you need to look for the forcing moves, moves that capture opponent's pieces or that are checks, which is why white uh, calculated a cute little trick, rook takes d5. And after queen takes d5, white took on e7, king to g8, and took on f7. And since both queen g7 as well as knight e7 with a fork on the black queen and a king are decisive and inevitable, Black just decided to call it a day right here. I hope this was a very instructive game that demonstrated what are the dangers of lacking behind in development and not being able to um, encounter your opponent's actions in the center and uh, what are the advantages of having an isolated pawn and the initiative related with that. I hope that you would like my first clip and let me know in the uh, comments what can be improved. I would be happy to uh, listen to your advice. Many thanks for watching and I look forward to seeing you in my next video. Bye bye.